Hello everybody! Welcome to another reactor stream. My name is Sarah. Um, sometimes when I have video and audio and screen, my bandwidth doesn't like it, especially when it's a little bit rainy, which it is right now. So don't worry if the audio is not perfect um, or the video is being delayed. I'm going to turn off the video for the majority. I just like to say hello. Um, welcome everybody. I'm really excited for today. Um, I don't know that we'll get through all eight, but I will have resources up as usual afterwards with lots of explanation and all of the code for you to play around with. Um, but really awesome. I'm glad the audio is good. Um, really I'm excited because, uh, you know, I've been on this data science machine learning journey for a little while now. Um, I am by no means an expert. Uh, but I am excited to learn and understand and create and um, explore it. And one of the things that I realized um, when I was working with Francesca Lazzari, which you might have seen her stream, she was streaming with me last week, um, and then she did a couple of streams this week, and uh, all of those videos will be on the Reactor YouTube uh, by the end of this week, by tomorrow afternoon, um, Pacific time. Uh, she is a machine learning expert. I mean, she's got her PhD in this. Um, she's brilliant. And she introduced me to the machine learning algorithm cheat sheet, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And this cheat sheet um, had eight different types of machine learning categories or categories of algorithms, eight different categories of machine learning algorithms. That's the sentence I wanted. Um, and each of them were basically answering a different type of question. And you might use a similar or the same algorithm depending on the data that you have and the question that you have across those categories. Uh, but it really allows you to stop and think about what you're trying to accomplish and then determine the correct tools to use to accomplish that goal. And I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, we've been developing new content around machine learning for um, more advanced folks as well as novice folks. And one of the things that we focus on is the data science lifecycle, which again, I'll, I'll briefly introduce you to. Um, and it really comes down to first understanding what questions you have, what data you have, and what you could reasonably answer, what knowledge you could reasonably garner from that data. And so today's stream is just going to be kind of exploring a couple of the more practical approaches to this. We're going to start with a little bit of an introduction to those eight different categories, and then I'm going to do some practical uh, coding with you. It's going to use Azure Machine Learning Services. So um, if you don't yet have an Azure account, you can get a free one. There are free trials. Um, so let me just plop those into the chat for you. Um, you can get a free trial uh, here. And um, you can also get a free trial um, if you are a student and you can verify your student status from here. Uh, so my intention is to introduce you not only to the tools, but also to um, the approaches. So I'll be using Azure Machine Learning Studio today. Um, I will use Azure Cognitive Services for one of them, and I'll explain why. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think we'll pretty much just get started. Um, just a quick note, the um, we do have a GitHub repo and it is publicly available. And if you head over to here, this is where I will be linking all of the resources that I create or um, all of the code that I create in my slides from today um, after the stream is over. So you can always head over here and find um, whatever resources you're looking for. Uh, as a reminder, we do have that YouTube channel and um, all of our streams are posted here by the end of the week. And so if there is a stream that you're watching and you're looking for some of the resources for it, odds are you'll be able to find the resources for that particular stream here and you can go to that month and, and likely find it. All right, let's get started. Hope everyone's doing okay. 
Um, perfect. So let's move over to my slides. Let me make sure I bring those up properly. And I'm just going to take my um, face off for now because I want to make sure that you can see a little bit better. Okay. So today we're going to be talking about the eight machine learning examples. And um, like I said, I want to start with the data science life cycle. And let me just grab this um, link for you. The data science life cycle really talks about an iterative approach to solving problems. Well, actually, sorry, I want to rename. I'm going to re-say that. Um, last Thursday, someone in the chat mentioned a really great way of defining data science. It was using data to um, to gain new knowledge, basically. And I, I think that's kind of what I the approach that I like to take. Um, so you start with this business understanding, and this is really important because the subject matter expertise and the understanding of what you're trying to solve um, is something that uh, uh, matters in the data collection that you're doing, in the um, uh, uh, types of questions that you're asking, and in the cleansing and manipulation of the data that you need to do. Um, so for example, if you are trying to predict uh, or you're trying to understand the trends of, of um, soil moisture, right? So maybe you have a garden and you want to try to see uh, what is the right amount of soil for the best growth of your plants. Um, it is not, or sorry, uh, and your sensors measuring the, the moisture of the soil go out for an hour because you're measuring it every hour. Um, you can reasonably assume that the moisture between the hour that it went out is probably a good average between the previous hour and the next hour, right? Um, because we understand how moisture and soil works and we understand kind of the intention and the questions that we're asking. Uh, so if we needed to fill missing data like that, we could just take the average of the previous one and the next one and, and fill it with that. Um, however, if you are trying to see how many people came to individual movies and or movie times, let's say, like movie showings of the same movie, uh, and you took you know, the, the five o'clock hour and the six o'clock hour and the seven o'clock hour, um, or sorry, let's let's do better hours than that. That makes sense in a movie theater. Let's say you took like the 11 a.m. hour movie showing and then you took the 4 p.m. one and then you took the 8 p.m. one, but you forgot to gather data for the 4 p.m. one, it would not be reasonable to take an average of the 11 a.m. and the 8 p.m. because 4 p.m. is just a completely different type of time. There's different implications into what's going on there, um, into, into the availability of people, et cetera, et cetera. So that would not be a good representation of your data. So having a decent business understanding is important. Then you do what I was just describing, which is the data acquisition and understanding. Then you start going through the machine learning modeling and deployment, and the deployment will allow you to gather more data and, and see how your data is doing. And then you, this is all just kind of a completely iterative process. We're gonna be focusing over here on the modeling and there will be some data acquisition and understanding, but we're not gonna focus on that today. Um, this is that algorithm cheat sheet that I was mentioning to you. And uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and paste this in there as well. This is the one that gets me really excited. Um, so this is where you have eight questions that you could ask yourself. For example, um, if you were trying to uh, determine if an occurrence, if an event is weird, if it's an anomaly, then you are likely going to want to use an anomaly detection type of machine learning algorithm. Uh, an example is, is uh, PCA, right? And um, if you were instead trying to, um, I don't know, uh, discover the type of structure in your data, right? Like you just have like a bunch, a bunch of data and you're not sure how to categorize it, how to structure it, what means what, then you might want to use a clustering type algorithm like k-means. This is unsupervised learning where you just let the machine learning algorithm go out into the data and try different things. Let's try to cluster it over here. Okay, that doesn't really make sense. Let's try to cluster it over here. So these are the types of questions um, that you can ask yourself when you're trying to determine which algorithms you want to go out after. And when I was initially doing this, this video series with Francesca, which by the way, you can find all of the resources for that 
here, including links to the videos um, on channel nine and on, um, on YouTube. And this video series did use Azure Machine Learning, but all of the code is just in Jupyter Notebooks up here on the repo. So you don't, don't have to use Azure Machine Learning if you don't want to. Um, we started exploring this and uh, I started kind of trying to think about these different classifications. So for example, predicting between two categories or predicting between categories. If you're trying to predict something between categories, you could either be predicting between two categories or multiple categories. So a two-class classification or a multi-class classification. A two-class classification example could be, um, I have a movie and I wanna know, is this a romantic movie or an adventure movie? Maybe that's all I care about. I care about these two classes. Or I wanna know, is this a cat or a dog? Or I wanna know if if um, it's daytime or nighttime. I wanna know, will, will a rocket launch or not launch? Two-class classification. Um, that's when you would use an algorithm like that, if you have a question like that. Multi-class is basically that, right? So if you have uh, multiple classes, uh, is this romantic adventure or a musical? Um, is this uh, a cat, a dog, or a hamster, etc.? Another category of algorithm is the is discovering patterns in your data. And really there's three types here. There's recommenders, like what will my customer buy next? Um, I'm sure we've all encountered recommenders, especially if you have um, uh, like basically used any kind of thing on the internet where you've either purchased something or it was a part of a community, right? You'll see uh, Twitter recommendations if you're on, on Twitter, if you go to your like for you notifications area, right? You'll see um, recommendations on Amazon if you're trying to buy things. If you play games with a, an online store, you'll see recommendations for games that you might enjoy as well. So this is where you uh, gather information about this particular person as well as every other particular person on that platform and you use that to determine what kind of thing they might wanna do, right? Clustering, um, so this is basically separating similar data points into groups. So for example, how can I segment my customers based on their preferences and run a better advertising strategy? Now, this is similar to recommenders and that's why it's in this similar category because it's about understanding what someone might want to do next or being able to target information towards them. Um, recommenders are different because it's like, what will this person want? Clustering is how do I know what types of people are on my platform, right? So um, uh, for example, if I were, uh, so one one of my favorite examples around clustering is is this idea of um, of trying to, or, or uh, like, like creating personas for individuals. And you know, this can get tricky if you over index on that, if you create personas that, that you know, um, uh, force people into one area, then they're never going to see other things. So for example, a few personas of mine. I am a dog mom. Uh, when I say that, you might have ideas about what a dog mom might want to buy, what she might want to do, um, who she is, what her ideals are. Uh, but then if I say I'm also a cat mom, uh, you, you might have a different picture in your head, right? I have two dogs and I have two cats. Um, so I represent multiple personas there. I am also a human mom in that I have a toddler. So I represent a different persona there, right? And um, if I am trying to sell something, whether I'm selling something for money or I'm just trying to sell an experience or you know information or something like that, if I'm trying to give something to a customer, it's nice to be able to understand um, what uh, types of customers I have. Because if I were to um, uh, assume that everyone on Amazon was a dog mom, but really a lot of them are cat moms, then I'm going to be um, you know, creating experiences or, or promoting products around dog moms when really that's not who's on my platform. So being able to understand who your customers actually are or you know, other types of things I'm, I'm thinking about customers. And then the third one in discovering patterns is anomaly detection. And we briefly chatted about this, but basically can I detect something that is strange, something that's a rare occurrence? So being able to determine, is this a rare occurrence? Um, 
what is a normal occurrence, what makes this occurrence rare, and then being able to predict if and when a rare occurrence will happen. So an example of this is being able to detect equipment anomalies and predict maintenance operations in industrial plants. Another example of this is um, I did an internship at a company called Viasat, and um, this was many, many years ago, but they would track uh, hardware that they were selling, and any time hardware came back that was um, malfunctioning or there was something wrong with it, they would track that in a huge, huge, huge spreadsheet. So they, they tracked everything that went out, and then they also tracked um, what came back. And there was one person at this company at the time who was tracking this huge set of sales. And she had this huge spreadsheet that just kind of, you know, she knew exactly how to do it. You'd have to zoom out and you couldn't see anything. It was just a ginormous spreadsheet. And um, she used that spreadsheet to determine if she could find unusual occurrences like yeah, every once in a while you're going to find one thing that didn't quite go through the factory correctly or, or you know, isn't working perfectly. That totally happens. But is this something that is like a rare occurrence happening often? Is this something that we need to worry about? Is this just a one-off or is this something more than that? That kind of question is something that an anomaly detection algorithm can help you determine. The next one is understanding images in natural language. Um, so image classification, is this image a dog or a cat? Text classification, what are customer feedback reviews on the quality of our products? I feel like these types of things are, are out there a lot because we now have really great AI services to help us with the most basic of these questions, right? So because a lot of times, or because a lot of people want to know, is there a person in this picture? Is there an animal in this picture? Um, we do have AI services, artificial intelligence services, that are built on the machine learning algorithms um, that have been trained with, with lots and lots and lots of information. And so we can just leverage those instead of having to train it ourselves. The benefit of that is training machine learning algorithms and machine learning training machine learning models takes a lot of data if you want it to be accurate. Um, if you want it to accurately represent the truth about the world as well as if you want it to, to, to be accurate in the predictions. And so if we can leverage things like AI services, even better. And there's lots of different AI services out there. Um, today I'll show you a little bit about Azure Cognitive Services. When would you not want to use AI services? That's going to be if you have something very specific to you where there isn't likely to be a lot of that data already existing in the world. So for example, um, for image classification, yeah, if you just want to know, is there a human in this picture? Reasonably speaking, that data exists and AI services are pretty good at that. If you want to know, um, is this, you know, my, my, my dog Winston or my dog Molly? That's a different question and that's very specific to my dogs. I'm going to need, um, uh, uh, pictures of my dogs and pictures of other dogs to determine whether or not this is my specific dog. So that's when I'm going to likely want to, to train something myself. Am I working on AI that can reason in Microsoft? Um, today I'm not going to be talking about that, but yes, there are, um, uh, so Azure um, bot services does a little bit of that and there's actually a really great um, video that we did at Build that I will link down here. Um, the reason I point out bot services is because that's one good entry point into kind of that reasoning about like what is someone trying to ask or what is someone trying, what information is someone trying to get at. Um, so let me make sure that I grab uh, this video. So. Um, Actually, what we can do is this, just to make it faster. Um, so we did one right here. Just triple check that this is the right link. Yes. Um, so this is an example video that talks a little bit about that. Okay, and then the last one, and then we'll get to some code, is the, um, 
is predicting results based on relationships between values. And oftentimes this is going to be a regression algorithm. And basically this is what are the forecasted sales quantity per item per store for the next four weeks. So um, can I understand the relationship between sales and, um, you know, quantity on the floor and um, a, a date and time, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to accurately predict how much sales. And this is useful for not, you know, overbuying product, et cetera. Okay, so these are the eight examples that if we don't get to all of them today, I will have examples of these up on the GitHub repo um, after the stream. So these are the eight different ones. So we talked about four broad categories. Here's the eight subcategories. And these are the types of things that we'll use today um, to go through some of them. And again, these slides will also be up after. All right, let me take a sip of water and then we'll get started. Okay, so um, today I do already have some code uh, running, but I'll walk you briefly through um, some of what I already did. So let's go ahead and hide my slides. So first of all, I um, opened up the Azure portal and I created um, two things that I'm going to need for this first one. We're going to first do text analytics. Um, in this case, I want to show you AI services. And that's because, again, if it's something useful, uh, that can even just be the first um, kind of step towards uh, um, uh, Sorry, if it's useful, it could be the first step towards um, uh, did, like understanding more about your data so that you know a more specific question to ask when you train your own model. Yeah, Graph Lab is something that I recently discovered. It's from a professor at CMU. And so if we don't get to it in today's stream, we will, um, uh, I will have uh, a link to some tutorials as well as uh, like a more in-depth one that I, I also do. I like to link to tutorials, but I also like to add mine because I find that sometimes I missed out on a lot of information that the tutorial didn't mention. And, and you know, it's never possible to have one <laughs> all encompassing tutorial uh, because everyone's going to have different things that they come to the, to, to the table with. So um, I figure if I can add some value, I will try to. So I created a cognitive services um, uh, resource as well as a machine learning resource. To create these, um, you can go to create resource and just search for cognitive services. Um, and that's how I created that one. Um, I just kept all of the same kind of like simple, I didn't change anything. So pricing tier, I kept it at standard S0. Um, I created a resource group for it and I changed it to West US location for because that's closer to me. Um, for the machine learning, again, similarly, you just have to search for machine learning and um, click on create. And again, uh, just kind of simple things. I did end up doing the enterprise edition. I don't think I really had to this time. Um, I did that when I was doing the video, the video series with Francesca. Um, so then that way we could collaborate together on it. Um, but uh, I just kind of like default to that. And then usually I delete my resources right when I'm done doing my experimentation um, because I'm in my learning phase at the moment. And so it's not a big deal if it's enterprise because the cost is not that big of a difference um, between the two. So I have these two resources, my cognitive services resource. Once you create it, um, you will have uh, like these instructions and you go to your keys and endpoints and that's when where you're going to find your key and your endpoint. So for example, my key is here, I could copy it, and my endpoint is this one. Yours will be different. For the machine learning, um, oops, for the machine learning resource, uh, what I do is after I have it, I click on launch now, and that opens up my um, uh, Azure Machine Learning Studio. And all I've done so far is create a new notebook. So I clicked on new, said notebook, and that created a new Jupyter Notebook. Uh, the first time that you create the notebook, it will ask you to create a compute node. So that's gonna happen just all inside of this view right here. So you don't have to worry about 
um, like setting anything up. And the nice thing about doing the notebooks in here, uh, not only is it just in a browser and so I can switch between machines relatively easily, um, but also um, uh, it already has like uh, Azure ML SDK installed so I don't have to set up my local environment. That being said, if you do want to do this in a local environment, our video series, I do walk through how to set up VS Code with um, uh, with the um, uh, with Azure Machine Learning Studio, sorry, Azure Machine Learning SDK, um, Azure ML SDK. So again, if you want to check that out and, and do it that way, feel free to do it. Um, and nothing really requires Azure Machine Learning in this case, um, or, or, or uh, except for we did use AutoML, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, and uh, in this example that we're doing today, we're gonna use cognitive services. So that does require Azure subscriptions, but you could use other things as well. What we're gonna talk about is the same. Okay, so I know this is not the best kind of view, but um, you don't need to read the text. The text is gonna be what you're gonna get later. Um, and I'll add more text to it once I am done. Uh, I did have to do a pip install of the Azure AI text analytics. So let me try to zoom in just a little bit more. And I'm sorry, I know that my bandwidth is not the best, um, but uh, uh, hopefully you can see it. And again, all of this code will be available. Not only will this code be available, but um, any kind of data source. So I've got this text file, um, this CSV file, and this um, Python file, any kind of anything else you will need will also be available on the GitHub. And again, you'll find that stuff right here. Okay, so let's actually get started now. Oops, I did not mean to click on that. Okay. Oh, goodness gracious. Oh, please don't take a long time to load. <laughs> Gosh darn it, why did I click on that link? Ah! <laughs> I hate that. Oh, come on, you can do it. I can take a sip of water at least. All right, let's go ahead and click on this. And actually, I'm gonna um, hide this for just one second while I make sure that my um, key is in. I'm trying to be better at not sharing my subscription keys. Uh, but you know, sometimes it happens. Okay, so now it is hidden. Perfect. So um, let's go through this. Uh, yes, I did have to um, install the Azure AI Text Analytics SDK here. Uh, and then the next steps are here. So I, above, you can't see this, but above I have my uh, key and endpoint specified. So I just commented these out for you later. We import our text analytics um, client as well as the Azure credentials um, package. So then that way we can connect to Azure and run through text analytics. This bit of code here is just a pretty standard bit of code for connecting to Azure Cognitive Services. Um, I basically just started with, and this is something that I think is really important is like understanding how we get to know how to do this stuff um, because there's going to be things that um, I'm not doing that you might want to try to do and I want you to know how to do that on your own. So I just went over to the Cognitive Services site. Um, so matching and correlating an ideal set with uh, a test set, that's going to be pretty much any algorithm that you're using because that's how we train our models. So uh, it depends on the question that you're asking, um, but we'll, we'll do that one in the next one. I'll show you that. So I went over to the two APIs. I went to um, language and then went to text analytics. And then over here, we've got some documentation and the documentation has, for example, a quick start. And this quick start, I could choose Python and it's got some code for us, so see? It recommends that you do a pip install. This says in the console, you can do it in a Jupyter notebook by putting that exclamation mark at the front, uh, your key and endpoint, and take a look. There is our authentication. Okay, oh, 
make sure I share this with you all as well. So um, we basically what this is doing is we're just connecting to our specific Azure Cognitive Services instance or resource. OK, so we're using our key and our endpoint um, and we're connecting to it. So if we run this, <clears throat> depending on if you've run something similar recently in the same browser, which I have, uh, this may just be successful. Uh, if if you haven't run it yet, then you will get a little output right here that says, hey, you need to authenticate. It'll have a link and a code. So you'll click on that link, put in that code, and it may ask you to sign into Azure. Um, because just because you have a key and an endpoint, we don't want anyone to be able to take those and be able to use them. We actually want you to make sure that it is you. So we'll, we'll have you actually sign in. OK, so what are we trying to do here? I took my dissertation um, and I uh, uh, wanted to start to see what was like, what did I talk about in it? <laughs> was I positive in it? Was I negative in it? Um, and so I just took the introduction chapter of my dissertation. So it was just like a very short introduction um, and it's 81 lines of text. And that is what we're going to analyze today. So first, we're going to create this function here. It's called sentiment analysis. And we're going to pass in the client, which is the authenticated Azure Cognitive Services client, and specifically the text uh, analytics one, because we created a text analytics client here. OK, so we're going to, to pass in our text analytics client and the document um, that we want to, to analyze, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, basically, we're just going to call on the client analyze sentiment because this is the text analytics client. So we'll say, I want to analyze the sentiment of this document. OK, and the sentiment of this document is going to be positive, negative or neutral. And then I'm just going to print out what the sentiment was. OK, so what how positive was it? How new, neutral was it? How negative was it? So again, this is just using an, an already created machine learning model. Um, and basically, you're just giving it new data and then not only um, getting the output, which is how positive, negative, um, and neutral, but also how confident, uh, specifically how confident the, um, uh, the AI thinks it is on determining whether or not it's positive, negative, or neutral. Uh, and then we're just going to go through all of them for that. OK, so did we run that? I can't remember. No, we didn't. So now we're going to open up my dissertation intro. We're going to read all of the lines and put it into a variable called text. So now this is a, um, a, a list of 81 strings where each string represents one line in the dissertation. Uh, there are some limits when you're using the S0 um, uh, uh, layer of um, or instance of cognitive services. And I want to use that because I don't want to spend a bunch of money on this example. Um, there are some limits. There's a certain number of calls you can make as well as a certain number of characters to analyze. So the number of characters is like 5,123 or something like that. So I just went through and I figured out how many characters, how many lines of my dissertation I could put in um, until I reached that number of characters. So I can reach, there's a total of 28,000 characters and I can reach only the first 11 out of 81 lines. Um, then I'm just going to uh, grab only the first 11 characters lines and I'm going to create one string with 5,000 characters in it um, that has that first bit of my dissertation. And then I'm going to call the sentiment analysis function with that one string. OK, so let's just print out so you can see what it looks like. So this is the first 5,000 characters. Can you stop doing that, please? I see you. Okay. This is the first 5,000 characters of my introduction, basically. So now we'll call it and we'll see what happens. Okay. 
So the overall sentiment of the entire document is mixed. We've got a little bit of positive, or we've got quite a bit of positive, but we do have some neutral and some negative. Uh, then for each sentence, uh, we're going to get a sentiment and then the score for it. So this sentence here is pretty neutral. That makes sense. I mean, the introduction, the first line is probably meant to be fairly neutral. Um, let's find one that isn't neutral. This one says that it's positive. Um, we can start to understand why we think it says it's positive. Uh, so for example, um, for best results, data from each interaction can be stored long term to be used as training data for future encounters with technology. So best results probably made it positive. I'm not sure. Negative. Uh, the resulting data is very useful for learning about how computers should adapt to better serve users, but often lacks utility in at the individual level. And that's negative. That makes sense. But often lacks utility at the individual level sounds fairly negative. So we can start to see how this AI is interpreting our text. Um, and that allows us to determine what new types of questions we want to ask or what further um, discovery we want to perform. I also wanted to do the key phrase extraction. So this is basically a similar um, type of approach, but this time we're going to, instead of trying to use the AI services to determine whether it's positive or negative, we're gonna use it to determine if there are any key phrases inside of the text. So very similarly, we're going to pass in the client and the text. We're going to use the text analytics client to extract key phrases by sending in the um, text. And uh, if there is no error, then we'll print out the phrase. And if there is, we'll print out the error. Fairly straightforward. So we can see here in the document that these are some of the key phrases. And this would allow us to then go in and um, and do some more analysis on like, what did we talk about in terms of personal data collection and, and why and um, and all of that. So again, we don't have a ton of time on this stream, so I did want to just kind of like give you an introduction. This is just a very basic introduction in how you can use AI services, um, whether they are Azure or otherwise, to start to understand text sentiment um, and then do further analysis on it later. All right, grab some water. Next, we're going to look into classifying images. And while there are um, Azure Cognitive Services for classifying images, uh, this time I wanted to do some, uh, do it all in code and actually train my own machine learning model on it. Um, so this one's going to be using logistic regression. And we'll, we'll walk through it a little bit. I did link to the tutorial that I am referencing here. Um, so, uh, that link will be on the, um, on the GitHub repo and you can find it here. So the first thing that we need to do is import all of the libraries and SDKs that we need. Um, because I'm doing this inside of Azure Machine Learning Studio, I don't have to, uh, do a pip install of the Azure ML SDK, um, but I will link uh, resources for how to do that in the, the repo as well. Uh, we do need NumPy, Matplotlib, um, and Azure ML. So let's go ahead and run that. Next, we're going to make sure that we have access to our workspace. So our workspace is this, right? Our workspace is the, um, is the resource that we created. And if you're doing this um, inside of a uh, a local environment rather than on Azure ML Studio, then you will have to make sure that you download this config.json file. Um, that's what we're going to read in right here to connect to the workspace. So I'll run this. We can see that we're connected to my eight ways demo um, uh, workspace using West US as the location and using the eight ways demo resource group.
Now we're going to create a new experiment. And so using Azure ML, this is how you can create an experiment. Specifically, um, this isn't yet uh, attaching the machine learning algorithm to the experiment. This is just creating the experiment that we could then pass in the algorithm and the training data and the testing data, which is what we were asking about earlier. Uh, this one is using an open data set, by the way. And that open data set is, um, and I don't know the right way to like say this, but it's, it's the MNIST uh, database. And this is handwritten digits. So it's 60,000 examples of handwritten digits. And this is an example of something that may not be in a, an existing AI service, especially if you wanted to do your own handwriting. The reason it may not be is because um, the, the handwriting is very um, uh, like um, unique, right? You're not gonna, and we'll, we'll be able to see it in a minute, um, but you're, it, it is not like uh, facial features are going to have pretty much the same features, but I don't know about you, when I write a four and a nine, for example, sometimes they look very, very, very similar because my handwriting is relatively sloppy. And so um, I wanna make sure that whatever algorithm I, or whatever machine learning model I'm training matches my handwriting. Um, in this case, we're gonna use an open data set that already exists, uh, but you could conceivably write down 60,000 characters in your own handwriting to do a similar training. Okay, so this next bit of code is again, some just kind of pretty generic code anytime you're using Azure Machine Learning Studio or services. So what we're going to do first is create um, a, a compute cluster, okay? So I named mine eight ways cluster. Um, and I uh, said I want a minimum nodes of zero and a maximum nodes of four. So basically what this is doing is creating a, a, a place of a machine, like reserving space on a machine to run your training and testing, to run your model. You could potentially also just do this on your own machine if you had a really powerful one um, or connect to some other server. That's I'm using Azure ML because it's easy for me. Um, and again, I'm, I'm kind of just like trying to explore these concepts um, at an introductory level. You can specify the VM size here um, and create the, uh, the compute if it isn't already there. Now, mine is already here because I've already run this cell to make sure that it's working. Um, so you'll see that if it, um, does already exist, we just say, hey, I found it, cool, we're gonna use this. And if it doesn't, then it actually goes in to provision a new um, compute cluster. Create it, wait until it's done, and let you know. So that's what this code is doing right here. Let's go ahead and run it. So we'll see, yep, hey, I already found that. Um, also, it will have found it, or you can see it here. If it wants to load, I'll let it keep doing its thing. Um, but the nice thing about using this interface, so, so this code will actually work if you wanted to run it locally because it'll connect up to your Azure uh, machine learning service through the config file. Um, if you were running it inside of Azure Machine Learning Studio, you could also just create a new compute instance here using this interface and then connect that up. Um, so this is my compute cluster. Here it is, CPU cluster. That's the one that it found, CPU cluster. Um, eight ways, ML eight, ML eight ways demo compute. That's just the one that's running the notebook. You can see it's Jupyter but the compute cluster to actually run our machine learning model, that is this one right here. And you could always just create it here. And then instead you could just say, hey, my compute target is this one. Okay, now we're actually gonna bring in the data set. This is when we're gonna be using Azure ML open data sets, which is just a, a, a sorry, 
Azure open data sets, which are public domain data for a lot of different um, uh, types of data. We've got weather, uh, census information, holidays, public safety, etc. cetera, um, that allows you to just kind of like explore new data and try out some of these techniques that we're talking about. So what we're going to do is create a folder called data, um, make that directory, and then we're going to grab from the um, uh, MNIST, which is the data set of handwritten digits. We're going to grab the data set file. Uh, we're going to download that data set into the data folder. And then we want to register that data set within our workspace so that it's not just this file in a folder, but rather it is an actual um, data set inside of Azure Machine Learning Studio. This, is allow this allows us to access it and reference it, um, uh, consume it, and associate the models that we are building with it. So let's go ahead and run that. Awesome. Oh my gosh, I just spilled water on my keyboard. Luckily, I have a big ergonomic keyboard and it just spilled on like the little hand rest. Oh, there's a tiny bit next to my space bar. All right, hopefully it doesn't get messed up. I do have a backup if needed. Okay. Um, oh, and it just reloaded. <laughs> now you just saw my, my key and endpoint. It's fine, you can't, you can't get into it unless you log in. Um, okay, where were we? Hello, hello. Okay, so now we're going to um, uh, import this function from this utils um, Python file, which I will provide to you. But basically what it's doing is it's bringing in all of the data without having to unzip this huge zip file because this huge zip file is huge. <laughs> um, it, these these uh, images are just ginormous. And so instead of uh, unzipping them and saving them in, in your local desktop or something like that, uh, we're gonna go through and we're gonna load the data in um, without having to unzip. It's kind of funny, I, uh, my, f my, second internship at Microsoft, this was like a decade ago, um, I wrote something very, very, very similar to this um, for our data warehouse team. Being able to read data from zipped files because even just downloading the zip file would be too large um, was important when you're trying to transfer and analyze data. So that's what this, this is doing. It's basically just loading in the data. So let's go ahead and import that. Um, and then we're going to load in portions of the data. So luckily this is already split into, wow, this is like tiny, sorry. <laughs> this is already split into um, training images, uh, training uh, labels, testing images, and testing labels. The reason why that's important is because when we are doing machine learning, and this is what someone was asking earlier about um, uh, matching and correlating your ideal set of data against a test set, right? Um, so when you are training your machine learning model, what you're doing is you're grabbing in the, um, like the input, so the images, for example, and then you also are um, sending the model the output or the answer, so in this case, the label. So this is going to be an image of a handwritten A, or contain an image of a handwritten A, and this will contain the label A in the same order, right? Then when we test our data, we're going to only send in the, um, the images, the input. The model will give us what it thinks the output is, and then we will compare that with the actual output the actual answer. This is very tricky and we can go in like you could like <laughs> the amount of knowledge needed to know about all of this is 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 massive meaning 
Um, depending on your data set, the, depending on the algorithm you're using, depending on the variability in the data, depending on the questions that you're trying to ask, depending on a lot of different factors, deciding how much of your known data, meaning the data where you have both the input and the output, the question and the answer, how much of your known data should you reserve for training versus for testing? And the reason why that's important is because if you were to um, uh, uh, give all of your known data to your model, then if new data was slightly different from your known data, meaning um, let's say that uh, the data that I collected was, um, was a combination of the weather in my, like around my home, and the amount of power that we used, okay? So I have an input, which is weather, and I have an output, and uh, my question is like, given this weather, how much power will I use? And the output is gonna be the amount of power I used. Now, if I only gather data <laughs> from winter, when it's cold and rainy and we use the heater, and I gave all of that data to my machine learning model, then it's going to know like for a fact that if weather is cold, you're gonna use the heater. And maybe even like if, if, if the temperature drops 20 degrees, you're gonna use the heater, right? So maybe, maybe we're asking like if there's a change in temperature. I don't wanna know the actual temperature of, the, of, of my home. I wanna know if there's a change in temperature. If there's a change in temperature outside of 20 degrees or more, we turn on the heater. So let's say that's what we that's what we did. Then let's say I gave it new data, which is summer data. Um, first of all, I was missing data, so that's one huge issue. Uh, but also, um, it has a the model now has one specific way that it understands data, and there was no way of testing it, right? Because we don't have any other test data for it. So then if I gave it new data and I'm like, hey, now it's summer and it dropped from 90 degrees to 70 degrees, guess what? I'm not turning on that heater. This is Fahrenheit. I'm not turning on that heater, um, but there was a 20 degree time difference or, or temperature difference. And so it might think that I, I, I will. Um, I kind of confused two things there. I was, I was confusing um, like the overfitting of using all of your training data and and not having like enough testing data with also missing data, like the difference between uh, summer and, and winter. Um, but that's what I mean in terms of this part right here, how much of your data and what parts of your data should you have for training versus testing? That is a huge, huge, huge question. Um, and we're not gonna get into all of the details here, but as you explore it, I think it's important for you to um, continue learning and, and develop your own understanding of this. The other interesting question here is if your data is ordered, then you probably wanna have a mixture. So for example, if our X train data was basically just all of the images, but the first 80% um, of them, okay? And all of our images are sorted in alphabetical and numerical order, meaning it goes A, B, A through Z in, in, and, and zero through nine, let's just say. Um, and I took 80% of that, then I'm only gonna have, let's say the alphabet. <laughs> so then if my testing data only has numbers, guess what? It's gonna perform really poorly, right? Um, so you also need to consider, do I need to grab a randomization of my data? Is it already randomized because there isn't any kind of order, et cetera? Okay, so we're going to load in our training data, um, our, our X train, which is the images, and our, um, our Y train, which is the labels, which, which letter is this representing? And our X test, which is images, and our Y test, which is labels. Um, now, what this is going to do is basically uh, show some randomly chosen images from the training set. Um, this is also useful prior to going in and, and running your machine or training your machine learning model, actually exploring and looking at the data. Now, this is a data set that we um, like it's been around. It is, you know, 
fairly validated. Um, we can relatively trust it. If it wasn't, um, you should be <laughs> going through your data and actually making sure that it's accurate and it's what you expected it to be and that there isn't anything that might throw it off. So let's actually take a look at some of these. So here they are. So what we're showing here is a random subset of our training set. Below you will see the image, so of the handwritten letter, and above it you'll see the label. So below is the X train and above is the Y train. And you can see that here, that's basically what we're doing. Um, this is just plotting, so we're, we're trying to just create a figure here. And the top is going to be our Y train and the bottom is going to be our X train. So you can see that there's a lot of variability here. Um, sevens, for example, this seven right here doesn't have a line down the center, and this one does, or across the center. Um, I don't know if they have an example of like a four and a four, but we can see like this five over here is a lot flatter than the five right next to it. Some ones are a little bit more um, uh, slanted. Uh, twos with the little loop-de-loo compared to twos with the straight line. Um, zeros that are uh, like a like a true circle kind of and then ones that have like a little bit of a tail inside of it. So we can see how this problem is, is going to be difficult. We can see how um, an AI service might not be as good at this if we're if it wasn't trained on this type of thing. Right. Um, now we're just going to create a script folder because we're going to create a training script um, for this model. All right. So let's run that. That just created the script folder. And um, that's going to be this folder here. And you can see I did already run these, but that's fine. Okay, so um, this is where we get into some of the more complex bits that, again, my intention here is to give you an introduction. Um, so I'm not gonna be an expert at all of this bit, but let's walk through it together. So basically what we want to do is be able to load in our training and testing data into um, basically it's NumPy arrays. Um, we're going to uh, <clears throat> get a hold of our current run. So where did we, um, so we haven't created a run yet because that's what this script is going to eventually do, right? Um, but we're gonna get a, a hold of our current like context and, and that's going to be the run, okay? And what is a run in Azure Machine Learning uh, Studio? A run is basically uh, uh, something that keeps track of, of your training and testing of your experiment, okay? So this isn't running anything. This is not running the experiment. This is not training or testing or anything like that. All this is doing is, is, is having something to keep track of that, okay? Then what we're going to do is we're going to um, train the logistic regression model. Okay, so we're going to create a logistic regression model and there's a bunch of different parameters that you can go look through. In this case, um, uh, oops, um, We are, um, sorry, uh, we're saying that it is like a multi-class classification here. And then we're going to fit our model. And so what this is doing is it's sending in all of the training data, the X training data, and all of the Y training data. So this is all of the X pictures, like the pictures in our training set and all of the labels in our training set. And, um, passing it into this existing algorithm calling fit 
what it does is the algorithm will try on its own, and you can look into how logistic regression algorithms actually work. Um, that's beyond scope of this one. It'll try on its own to um, like start to understand, okay, so if, if I see this picture here, that means it's a three. Okay, if I see this one, this picture here, that means it's a one. So then it might look at this and say like, oh, but what is this? Oh, that's a nine. Okay. And it'll start to just kind of understand and learn. And that's basically what machine learning is, is it starts to learn. Um, I do have some like anecdotes on on how that's similar to how humans learn. Uh, I'm not going to go into it now because I do want to get to some other ones also. Um, but we do have additional content coming out in the future to, to kind of explain some of that. Then we're going to make the prediction. So this is where we pass in the images in the testing data set to that model and ask it to predict. And what it will return is the labels that this model thinks represents this, these images. OK, so these are all of the steps to machine learning is create the model, fit it, predict. Now, if you're doing more advanced machine learning, you might actually be um, creating new machine learning algorithms. Um, as you get more advanced, you'll have more uh, variation in the parameters around the model that you use, um, uh, that you're using. In this case, we're using just some pretty basic things because we are being pretty basic. Then you will predict the accuracy of the prediction. In this case, it's did you get the label right or not, right? Um, in other cases, if you were doing some kind of like prediction on, uh, on prices, for example, it might be like how close were you to the prices? In this case, it's really just did you get it right? OK, so we're going to create a new um, array that contains the average. Sorry, not a new array. We're going to create um, a variable that contains the average of how many were correct in these two arrays. And that'll be our accuracy. Um, then there is these bits um, that are a little bit beyond my full understanding because um, it gets more into the mathematics of things. Uh, but then you start to do some like normalization of things and regularization of, of data. Um, right now, I, I more so understand how we are uh, just kind of like getting the, the exact numbers. Um, but that's the next kind of step is understanding what those numbers mean and do you need to uh, normalize them, et cetera. And then we're going to create an output directory and we're going to save the model that we just trained into that output directory so that we could use it again in the future. All right, so let's go ahead and run this. So this is doing it again and it's overwriting um, what I already did. Right? Just in case I made any changes, it wants to make sure that it's up to date. All right. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to make a copy of that utils um, Python into that script folder, um, just because we are going to like make multiple calls. Um, this is a. Uh, Um, sorry, uh, this is bringing in some dependencies uh, using some of the environments that already exist. For example, um, the Azure, Azure ML has a tutorial environment, so we can just use that environment. Um, this is useful because this tutorial environment will have all of the dependencies that we need in order to run this uh, training or in order to train and test our model. And so we're going to save that environment and use that one um, when we when we actually want to run our scripts. All right, and then um, 
this bit right here is um, basically creating um, so this one was new to me prior to this stream so an estimator object um, basically what this is doing is it's a pre-configured common like estimator for common machine learning frameworks so for example um, we we basically are using this to send to our run um, because it's going to my understanding and someone please correct me if I'm wrong down in the comments um, is it's basically going to uh, tell our compute how this will likely be run. So it's it has the training script, which is the one that we created, the compute target, which is the one that we created way earlier, um, and the environment, which is the one we just created. And it's going to tell basically your machine, hey, this is what you need to do. You need to use this compute target with this environment and run this script. Basically describing the configuration for a successful run. And then we're going to actually run it. Well, we're going to create the run. <laughs> so this is submitting the um, uh, experiment to Azure using this configuration, and it creates a run. And one of the neat things is we can actually see this run in Azure Machine Learning Studio under our experiment. So this is the second run that I've created because I did one earlier. It has nothing, no data, no metrics because it hasn't actually started yet, right? We can see that it's queued right now. Um, we can see earlier, this is my um, scikit-learn MNIST um, experiment. And we can see that there was a run earlier that was completed after five minutes. And we can look at that run in a minute. Let me kick off this one though. So then we're going to um, specify that we want to see the run details as it's going. So this is going to just pop this up here. This is not required, but it's useful if you want to kind of see what's happening as it's happening. Uh, and then we're going to um, specify that not only should it run, but we're going to not finish this cell. We're not going to have this cell end. Um, it's going to continue to run until the run is complete which last time it took about five minutes. We'll see, we'll see what happens this time. Uh, while we're waiting for that one, we can go check out the first run. So we can see that that was just this morning, that it took almost six minutes. Um, and uh, this was the input data set right here. So um, this is going to be the data set that we import, imported, um, we loaded in. Um, uh, when we did the utils load data. We can see that it has a 91.9% .9 accuracy and regularization rate. I still need to learn a little bit more about that, so I'm not going to comment on it right now. We also just get a lot more information here. So if you did have a lot of other metrics that you were tracking, you'd have that here. There were no images or child runs. Here's some output logs that could be interesting. Um, I don't typically go in to look at these. Um, uh, snapshots, so this is uh, just um, like the, the, the um, scripts, that's the word I was looking for, um, the scripts that you're, you're using, any explanations if it's, if it's useful, um, and fairness is something new, but it doesn't, there's nothing in here for that one. This one again is, is relatively straightforward, it's, it's just kind of labeling images. Um, other experiments, other machine learning types uh, will have other types of things. And when you get into AutoML, there's some interesting bits there. So with 91% accuracy, we can, um, we can give an image to this model of a handwritten number. 
and it will, with 91.9% accuracy, let us know which number that is, which is pretty good. Um, you can get metrics here, and actually this might work because we have the old one, maybe. Oh no, we did just create the new run. Yeah, the, this one's pointing to the new run, so uh, yeah, it's not gonna work yet. But um, we can actually see those same metrics um, uh, these ones, the accuracy and regular, regularization rate uh, inside of the notebook as well. Um, and we can get all of the file names of all of the things that we used. And then finally, we can actually register our model. Uh, and the reason why it's useful to register the model is because then you can deploy it and use it in other areas. So for example, we can head over here. Um, oh, I didn't register the model yet. Oops. So I'll run that once we can. Okay, so that is the basic process. There's gonna be some differences um, between what you're trying to do and, and um, uh, which machine learning algorithms you're using, uh, what your data set looks like. But in general, this process is pretty much the same anytime you're running machine, like anytime you're trying to train and test machine learning algorithms, um, especially if you're using Azure ML uh, and Python and Jupyter Notebooks, um, which is my preferred environment. This one was an example of how images get classified, but honestly, it's essentially the same thing as if you had other types of data. So images themselves um, are really just a composition of a bunch of, of unique data. It might be just the pixels, right? So um, I think this one had, oops, sorry about that. I think this had an image of what it would look like. I thought I saw, where did I see that? Yeah, kind of like what what an image might um, might look like. It might be uh, what is the color, the RGB value of that individual pixel, right? So I don't think we'd be able to see this clearly, um, but uh, for each for each picture, this row represents all of the pixels in that picture and each value in each of the um, cells represents the color of that pixel. And so each row would represent the entire picture. And actually you can do some fun stuff with this, um, with some simple code as well, uh, using different uh, novice libraries. Uh, we did this um, at my university in the intro classes where we just Again, similarly, we, we converted pictures into pixel arrays, and then you can, you know, change anything that is blue in the picture to red, for example. So pictures are really just, um, in this instance, a series of arrays. When we are looking at something more like, is this a, a picture of a person? Um, that's why I would use something like AI services because that gets a lot more complex because it's not about the individual pixels. It's more about the structure of it. I mean, this is also about the structure of it, but um, it's like uh, somewhat more extrapolated data. So for example, one of our favorite um, uh, uh, examples is, is, can you determine if this is a skydiver or if this is a scuba diver? because a skydiver and a scuba diver look very similar. You're gonna have a predominantly blue background. Um, the figure is going to be in a floating type state. Um, the figure is likely to have their face covered, so you're not likely to see their face very well. Um, the, the figure is, is likely to have um, external, you know, like, like equipment, whether it be the, the oxygen tank or the, um, or the uh, uh, parachute. I was gonna say balloon, it's not a balloon. Or the parachute. Um, there might be some mountain-like looking uh, uh, shapes in the background or even foreground. Um, when you're when you're skydiving, it might be a real mountain. When you are scuba diving, it might be like you know coral or or undersea caverns or or things like that. 
Um, there might be other um, objects floating around the main object, um, meaning fish or birds. <laughs> um, uh, so skydiver versus scuba diver is an interesting image classification type question. All right, take a sip of water. So the next one I wanted to show you was AutoML. Um, but now I'm looking, we've got about 40-ish um, minutes left. Um, we, can, we can probably go through it fairly quickly. Uh, there was also other AutoML uh, videos earlier this week and last week, so um, that's why I'm considering perhaps going to the K-means clustering one, but let's, let's explore it quickly. Uh, let me make sure this is done, though. I think it's still running. Yep, still running. All right. Let's get that one ready to go. Okay, so for this AutoML, um, actually, do we want to take like, let's take one, like a one minute-ish break. Um, let this finish, then that way we can actually write the code. Uh, get up and stretch for like five seconds. All right, so we're gonna take like a short, short, short break. It's gonna say five minutes on the screen, but let's let's do three minutes. So at, at 20, minute 20, we'll come back. All right, yes, this is recorded um, for viewing afterwards and you'll be able to find it right here. All right, quick, quick break.
All right. That is still running. Since we already saw it finish, I might just um, close it off. Yes. Happy um, to recap. Um, after the break, friend function. Did you mean about to keep track of the data? Um, I don't know what your last question means. Um, but yes, good point. We should probably recap. <laughs> um, so let's walk through briefly or quickly the code that we did. Uh, so basically what we did for, and we didn't, I don't think we really did a recap for the AI services one, but, um, that one is super quick, right? So that one, we just got some text and we sent it up to Azure Cognitive Services and we said, hey, what's in here? And it said this. Um, we said, hey, is this positive, neutral, or negative? We did that by calling um, uh, where did my sentiment analysis function go? Oh, here it is. Uh, we did that by calling analyze sentiment, which is just an Azure Cognitive Services function and passing in the text. Um, then we said, hey, what are the important words in here? And we did that by calling uh, extract key phrases function, excuse me, which is just a, a function of Azure Cognitive Services Text Analytics API. And it said this, this is what's there. Um, the importance of this one was that uh, what's behind the scenes is what we basically did in the next part, um, which is actually training the model, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for the next one, what we did was we connected up to Azure Machine Learning. Uh, Azure Machine Learning. Uh, the purpose of this is that we wanted to be able to use a lot of the features, um, namely like the workspace, having one area where we know that all of our experiment experiments, um, data sets, and models exist. Uh, so we connected up to that. Then we created a new experiment, and this is uh, something that exists inside of our workspace that contains um, the specific runs, uh, which is what creates uh, our models. Then we created a compute cluster to be able to run our, our uh, experiment or our runs. Um, uh, an iteration of our experiment is a run, right? So to be able to run um, and, and test everything because it's it requires a lot more power than I have on my local machine. Um, then we just brought in the data from external places. Uh, we split our data into training and testing data and training input data and training output data and testing input data and testing output data. We just took a look at what that data looks like to give us an understanding. We created a script that would basically go through our data um, and uh, uh, it, it might do some, some basic modifications to it to, to um, make sure that it's in the right shape and everything like that and do some basic cleansing. And then we um, said, hey, on our experiment, we want to run um, this algorithm, basically. So this algorithm right here is the logistic regressions algorithm and we passed in the X train and Y train. So our input training data and our X output training data to fit this model. Fitting it is basically the act of the model learning based on that training data. Then we said, okay, you've had enough time to fit your data. Tell me what you think this is. And we passed in our testing data. And then we said, let's see how accurate you are because I don't know about all that. And then we did something that I don't fully understand, which is the regularization rate, um, which I encourage you to go check out on your own. Um, I will also go learn about it on my own and come back to you all in, um, in my notes. Uh, and then we put our model because now we have this model that has been fit and, um, and, and scored basically. And we were happy with the score. It was 90, it was 91.9% accurate. We're like, heck yeah, that sounds pretty good to me. Um, so we saved that, um, that model that we fit into a, um, uh, I think it's called like PICL, I think is how people pronounce it, but basically into a machine learning model format in an output folder. Um, then we actually, uh, 
used this tutorial environment that is available to us through Azure ML, uh, which basically just ensures that our compute cluster has all of the right dependencies needed to be able to run our, um, our algorithm. Uh, and then we did this estimator, which again, I need to go look more about it. Um, my basic, basic understanding is just that we, uh, uh, it, it's just like the explanation of what, what um, it's like the configuration, right? Everything you need to know to be able to do this. And then we actually ran it. Well, we created the run and then we, we ran it. And it ran. <laughs> slash is running. I don't know if it has any kind of information down here. Job release is complete, so I don't know if that means that it's done, but it still says it's running. So uh, we can actually go check super quickly over here. Let's go into experiments. Let's go into this one. Oh, it says it's completed. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know why it seems like it's hung then. Hmm. Okay. Um, well, I'm gonna go ahead and clear all outputs. I'm gonna interrupt my kernel and clear all outputs. And we'll go ahead and just kind of get started with the next bit. Uh, the last bit right here was just going to be to um, get our metrics and register our model if you wanted to be able to use it uh, in other applications. Um, you can also, no problem, um, create a model here and no, okay, sorry. I was trying to see if I could do something quickly, but I can't. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to do is predict values, okay? And so that's what we were talking about over here. It's going to be using AutoML, specifically regression models, to be able to predict values. Now, what is AutoML? Um, uh, what is AutoML? <laughs> I'm not going to go into a huge discussion on it because there were other streams that talk about it, but um, automated machine learning basically is where you, you provide, and in this case it's Azure that is providing this service, but you provide Azure with a type of algorithm, classification, regression, time series forecast. You provide Azure ML with a type of algorithm and it'll run through all the different specific algorithms of that same type. So in our previous example, we specifically said, I want to use logistic re regression. Um, maybe that wasn't the right exact regression model to use. So we could have run it through auto ML and um, and what it would do is run it through all of the different regressions. It'll also change some of the features and, 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 and basically just kind of like try all of the different things and, um, and it'll decide which is the best one uh, that gives you the most accurate value. I do wanna point out that you can use AutoML. Um, there's a preview of this where it's like a no to low code uh, example. I'm not going to do that one in this one. I'm going to do a code example in this one um, only because this can be more straightforward. And uh, Cassie Brevue, who's a cloud advocate here at Microsoft, did a demo of three, three or three or four, three different um, ways of doing uh, uh, low to no code machine learning um, uh, modeling. So you can go watch hers. Okay, so let's get started. Um, let's pull up this next um, this next example. So uh, this one I'm going to do what I what I prefer to do typically, which is type things out. Uh, we'll see how well how well I can do it, um, how fast I can do it. Uh, we do have just about 20 minutes left, so um, and then I'll provide you with additional resources um, after the fact. So we're we're going to be using the open data sets again. And this time what we're going to be grabbing is the New York City um, taxi information. In addition to that, we're going to import pandas because 
we always want to use pandas. <laughs> um, and we're also going to be importing uh, date time. And date time is, um, is, a, is a package that allows us to um, easily format dates and times and then be able to perform better analyses on them because they are better formatted. Um, okay, and then uh, there's also this bit right here, which is another uh, um, useful thing for uh, date when you're when you're doing something based on a date, um, and it allows us uh, to basically just get uh, more abstracted information about dates and times. Perfect. So we've got all of those things in there. Now what we're going to do is create a pandas data frame that we will now fill with our data. And the reason that we need to do this in this way instead of um, if you've seen previous streams, we kind of just say, oh, here's a CSV file, go ahead and grab it uh, and put it into a data frame is because the open data sets only allows us to grab one month of data at a time just in case you get any kind of memory error um, or even potentially like a bandwidth problem with it with um, fetching large amounts of data and so rather than having you accidentally do that it's going to require that you do it one month at a time uh, might seem kind of annoying but at the same time it's better than continuously trying to do this and getting an error and not understanding why you're getting an error when you are tr doing the right thing. <laughs> okay. Um, right now what we're doing is we're just uh, uh, stripping the time to make sure that it looks something like this. So we want all of our times, um, all of our date times, so all of our dates in this case, uh, to have the same type of format. We want to make sure... Um, that it is not okay perfect um, that there's no variation there uh, now we're going to grab each month one at a time and I do like to show and talk about this side of the process because while the thing that you might be most interested in is the you know running of the machine learning model um, this part is like one of the most important parts, which is how do you get your data into uh, your environment where you can start to um, analyze it and understand it? And how do you get it into a format that best represents the truth about your data? Because realistically, data is messy. It's not um, always accurate. Uh, it's got some variation, it has bias in it, and this part of, of data science and machine learning is just absolutely critical. Um, oops, I didn't want to do that. All right. So what this did basically was it's just it's just a very simple thing to say. I want to grab from the start and then we're grabbing, so that's what the relative delta is. It's it's grabbing uh, that particular month. So that's why we imported it. Okay, so we're just grabbing we're just grabbing one month, specifically the month either one or two or three, whatever it might be. And then we're going to um, in our data frame save the data. And after we run all that, we'll go ahead and print out the first 10 lines. Or 10 rows. Okay. Let's check it out. I didn't have an error anywhere, did I? Um, oh, actually. Oh, that's right. Just taking a little while. It is a lot of data. <laughs> that's why we have to do it in this way, right? Because it's a lot of data. Oh. It has been very, very hot where I live lately. And yesterday and today I've been cold. 
and I think I got like a minor sore throat thinking that it was going to be hot and leaving windows open at night and then it was cold and then cold air went into my lungs and oh I'm all wonked out now all right keep going keep going keep going So the next bit that we're going to do after this is loaded in is is something that was new to me when Francesca and I did this video series, um, which is which is features. And when I first started learning about them, again, this is where you can find the resources for that data series or that um, data science series. But when I first started learning about featureization and features for for of, of your data for machine learning. Um, I didn't really understand it because all of the data that I had been working with was really straightforward. Um, I really just wanted to know, does this column predict this other column? Um, but when you start getting into more complex questions that you want to answer or hypotheses that you have or knowledge that you want to acquire based on your data, you do start to uh, need to understand your data in a different way. Um, so basically, uh, my now understanding of featureization uh, is where you build, you potentially build or just specify features based on the data that you have. So in this example, what we're going to do is we're going to create um, a set of si time features that represent the pickup date, the month, the day of the month, the day of the week, and the hour of the day. So this is all pickup information. When was a passenger picked up by a taxi? We want to know uh, <clears throat> of that date. Specifically, I want to know the month, the day, the day of the week. So month would be like January. Day would be like the fifth. The day of the week, like Monday, and the hour of the day. And that's because what I want to know is based on that type of featureization of my data, how can I predict like taxi pickups and stuff? That's what I'm curious about, right? Taxi fares. So how can I predict how much I will make on a particular trip based on that information? I don't want my machine learning model to get confused by just looking at hour of the day because hour of the day is very dependent if this is a weekend or a weekday, um, if this is a Friday or a Monday. Um, day of the month totally dependent because it changes like the fifth of every month is not a Monday right so rather than um, confuse our algorithm or or have it find things that aren't actually what I'm looking for I want to say look all of these columns all of this information that is what matters to me and that's what I want to know of this type of feature what what is the the likely fair all right, this one is done. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to do is build those features. So this is just gonna be a very simple function, uh, build time features. And we're gonna import a vector which is basically going to be, um, uh, oh my gosh, my, um, uh, Oh my gosh, sorry. Uh, all of our data that we brought in. My throat really did start hurting just, as, just now. Okay, so pick up date time. This is the date and time that someone was picked up. <laughs> um, is the, like, the first value of our data. Or we're gonna grab the first one, right? That's one pick up date time. And then we're going to call um, num. Sorry, we're going to save the month number. So January would be one, February would be two. And we're gonna do the same thing for a bunch of other stuff. So let's just, we're gonna get the um, day of the month, day of the week, and hour of the day. So day of month, um, day of week and hour of day and then we're gonna call day and weekday um, happens to be a function which I did not know okay and then we're going to return a series which is all of that 
right? And so this is basically one object, a series object, um, or type or variable, one variable that represents all of this because that's going to be what we want to use to predict a fair. Okay? And um, this is doing it on, um, we want to do this on each individual one. So let's take our green taxi DF. And we are going to um, uh, create a new column for this, right? So a new set of columns for these. Num day of month. Ugh. Okay. And those columns are going to be from the pickup time and date. So this is one column, right? And it contains all of that information because it's the, um, it's all of the date and time of the pickup. <laughs> and then we're going to apply um, to apply this function to that row. So for each row, we're going to grab that column and in information. We're going to apply this function to it. That's going to return a series, which will get saved into all of those other columns that we just built. And this is going to be on a per um, per row basis. OK, that'll become more obvious what we did um, if we can just take a look at it. So for example, um, a pickup date time looks like this again, right? So this is uh, January 30th, 2015 at 7.30 um, a.m., 7.30 a.m. with 19 seconds, right? And so what we did, oops, sorry, find the right scroll. Um, what we did was we added ba -ba 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 -ba, our month number, our day of month, our day of the week, and our hour of the day because those are the ones that we're going to want to care about. Those didn't exist as individual columns, which would have made it more difficult to understand, um, uh, to be able to predict on those because they just existed as entire, um, uh, like as one value. Awesome. Now, notice that we have all this other stuff in here as well. Uh, a lot of the information is like missing also, um, like the location ID and the longitude, or well, longitude, latitude, latitude are not missing, but like we have that information. We have like a bunch of other columns in here, um, the tip amount, the tolls amount, some things that we maybe don't care about. So now we're going to do some data cleansing and remove some of the columns that we don't care about. So columns to remove and this time I'm going to cheat because we have a lot of columns that we want to remove and I don't want to type them all in because I am lazy. Um, also I don't want to run out of time and we're getting close to there. So we're going to just drop like all of the stuff <laughs> basically um, because that's not what we're curious about. Okay. Um, and then from there we're going to go for each column in columns to remove we're going to um, drop those columns. Okay, and then let's just go ahead and take a look at that. Not 50. <laughs> cool. So now we've got uh, passenger count, trip distance, uh, where you were picked up from, where you were dropped off the total cost, and then the month, day, day of the week, and hour. So this is the information that is mo most likely to be able to predict the total amount 
right? Where you were picked up and where you were dropped off, that tells us some distance. It also tells us like what part of town. Um, uh, we do have the distance here. So like what part of town you were in, how many passengers there were, also like which vendor it was, um, that might have a difference. And then the, the, the um, date time information that we cared about. Um, remember that you can always do things like this to get an understanding of if we are missing any information or if there's anything that looks strange. Um, so now let's actually do the machine learning. We're going to do AutoML here. So we're going to first um, make sure that we are connected to our workspace. I'm going to start copying and pasting code now so then that way we can make sure that we get this done. So we're going to connect to our workspace. This is the same thing that we did before. Now we're going to use scikit-learn to split our data. Um, this is a great, oh, what? No, I'm not going to use it. I'm not going to use it. Um, what did I miss? What did I miss? Oops. Oh, silly me. I missed an entire um, section, sorry. Prior to doing this, sorry. Um, there was multiple describes. We're going to do this bit right here. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to do a uh, um, a query on things that are out of the range that we're interested in looking at. Okay. So um, if our passenger count was greater than zero and our total amount was greater than zero, um, then we want to remove it? What? Final DF, final DF query. Um, oh, no, not if it is. So these are all the things that we want to keep, basically. Um, and then uh, we're going to collect all of the um, uh, columns that we want to remove because we're, we're, so, okay, let me be very clear here. So what we're doing is we're first only grabbing the, um, the trips that were within this pickup latitude. OK, uh, and we're saving that into a final DF variable. And then we're going to look at the longitude and, and grab a further subset of that. And then we're going to look at the distance and grab a further subset of that. And then we're going to look at the passenger count and grab a further subset of that. OK, and what that is going to do is um, create and then uh, uh, create a data frame um, uh, Sorry, I was trying to type and talk at the same time. Create a data frame, final DF, that only has the rows that we actually care about. It's a subset of the data. Then we're going to remove the lat latitude and longitude data because we don't actually want that to influence anything because those are just like these big numbers that that might throw things off. Um, and, and we're going to be left with something very soon here. Come on, let's go. I don't know why this is taking so long, but basically we're going to be left with um, the same data, but only a subset of the data um, and without these four columns right here. So that'll give us the vendor, passenger count, trip distance, total amount, and then the um, date time information that we cared about. Oh, come on. Ooh, that's really interesting. That green taxis cannot pick up in Midtown Manhattan. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter for, for this today, but uh, that is really interesting information. Um, and that's where like subject matter expertise can actually play a big role. Um, because if you didn't know that and you had a particular like latitude, longitude that included Midtown Manhattan, and maybe you were curious only about that, then you would get very confused here, right? Why are you not completing? Did I have like a some columns to remove for training? Did I mess something up? No, you were fine. Come on. Do you really take this long? Do not really take this long. Oh, I need you to be done so that we can do this train split. <laughs> OK, I'm going to let it like sit here for a minute, I guess. Come on, dude. We're so close. We were about to run the AutoML config. <laughs> All 
All right, well, I'm gonna start writing the code anyways, um, and then hopefully that'll run quickly. So we're gonna test, uh, we're gonna split our training and testing data. Um, so I can learn offers this really, really great train test split function that just allows you to do it. You pass in the data frame, um, you say how much you want of your data. In this case, we want 20% of our data to be testing data. Um, we give it some kind of random state because again, we wanna make sure that it's not just grabbing from the same vendor, for example, and it'll split our data into training data and testing data. Super awesome. Um, from there, uh, we're going to automatically train a model. Okay. So in this case, we're going to create some auto ML settings. And these auto ML settings are, um, are right here. And let's talk through them quickly. So iteration timeout, basically um, we're going to timeout after two minutes. We do not want this runtime to last for days. So just go through, um, you know, a certain number of, of go through the, all of the algorithms you want to go through, but you only got two minutes for each one. Um, experiment timeout, a maximum amount of time in hours that all iterations combine. So not only will you each iteration only take two minutes, but I want it to only last for um, 0.3 hours, which is what, 20 minutes? Um, so at most 20 minutes. So this wouldn't complete anyways um, during this time, but, but I'll, I'll uh, be posting all of the code afterwards for you to try out too. Um, Enable early stopping. Yes. So if if uh, the score is not improving, just stop. Like you reached it. You're good. It's fine. Um, your primary metric, a metric uh, that you are going to use to measure the accuracy or the score of your model. Um, there are many, many, many metrics you can use. In this case, we're going to use Spearman correlation. I am not an expert in metrics, um, but uh, uh, I encourage you to continue learning that as I am as well. For featureization, we already did like a pre-featureization by making sure that we're removing any of the columns we don't care about and splitting the type of data that we want. So we want AutoML to just automatically featureize. So that means prioritizing different columns, um, combining them into, you know, like multiple columns to be able to determine whether or not that, you know, these two together would, would be more likely to influence something, et cetera. Um, control the level of logging and then how many cross validations splits to perform when validation data is not specified. Um, from there, you're going to create an auto ML config file or object. And basically this is saying, I want this to be a regression. Um, this is where I want you to put the logs. Here is my training data. This is what I want you to predict. Okay. And then here's my auto ML settings. Pretty straightforward right there. Um, and then we just basically like create this run. So we say, hey, I wanna create a new experiment inside of this workspace called Taxi Experiment. And I want to submit this AutoML config to this experiment and save that run. And then you say, oh, and by the way, I want to keep track of what is happening on this run. So just like before, can you show the details of what's happening? And then I want to say, um, I want from you at AutoML um, the best run, the one with the best score, and which model, which is the, the fitted model. So after you've after you've trained this, you will be left with a model. Remember, that's what happened in the last one. So give me the best run, and then whatever model that is, I want that. I want to save that, OK? And then basically what we're going to do is we're going to grab um, our testing output data so we're going to grab x test and we're just going to get rid of the total amount column and that creates our our y test okay so this is um our our correct answers and we're just going to remove the total amount and then we're going to say hey that fitted model that created our best run go ahead and predict this and you're good and we're running out of time um uh so i will i will i will link this um, afterwards. Just remember, you can head over here and all of these will be linked um, after uh, after the, the bit. Um, IDE, this is uh, the Azure Machine Learning Studio um, Jupyter Notebook IDE. I don't know if there is dark mode, um, but uh, you can actually do all of this in VS Code as well. 
Um, a couple of last minute quick, quick things that I want to tell you. Um, please, um, if you can, I would very much appreciate it if you could please take this survey. Um, just go to aka.ms slash reactor feedback and put in the code 7804. Um, this helps us know if this kind of content is useful for you, if you'd like to see other type of content um, and what I can do to better support you on your learning journey. Uh, remember that all of the resources will be on that July events resources markdown file. Um, so please go ahead and check those out. I'll put them up um, as soon as possible. And all of our videos are recorded and all of our streams are recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. Um, so you can check those out every single week. We post the four videos from that week up by Friday afternoon. So please uh, feel free to check out all of these um, resources. Thank you so much, not only for joining me today, but joining me in the chat, um, joining my colleagues throughout the week. And um, I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Please stay safe. Um, stay warm or cool, um, stay happy, and uh, continue learning. Thank you all so much.